Kurt, um, at least in some ways, you're, you're the cause of all of this. Um, can you talk about the original impetus behind Baldridge, some of the early expectations, some of the early challenges, and how the framework and criteria were originally arrived at? Yeah, Bob, uh, uh, the history uh, is an unusual birth uh, to the Baldridge and the name and so on, so I, I won't uh, go into a lot of that detail, but I will say that in the 80s, there was a great deal of concern uh, with U.S. competitiveness, and particularly the quality of products relative to Japan, uh, consumer reports and a number of uh, consumer surveys were showing uh, you know, clear comparisons, U.S. products, electronics and autos and so on, that um, we, we simply weren't keeping up um, with the changes in technology and the Japanese who started out so far behind us in quality were now the world leaders. That led to some concern, including some observations about how the Japanese had uh, turned around their efforts via the Deming Prize and some people in the U.S. got the notion that maybe a comparable award in the U.S. Um, would have similar effects. Uh, legislation was introduced, um, reintroduced, and um, in 1987. And at that point, we at the National Bureau of Standards were working on initiatives in uh, measurements to support U.S. industry in science and technology to, to remedy some of the quality problems, but we were science and technologists and not um, award givers. But uh, that uh, summer, Malcolm Baldridge, who was our Secretary of Commerce, um, uh, passed away after a rodeo accident, and somebody got the idea to name the National Quality Award for him and the award went from totally unlikely to pass to it's going to pass right away. So this ended up on our doorstep in 1987, and President Reagan was uh, determined to give the first awards in 1988 to not only recognize uh, award, uh, awardees in the United States, but also to honor his Secretary of Commerce, Malcolm Baldridge, so needless to say, that uh, <laughs> summer transitioned my career from uh, chemist to uh, full-time um, award uh, designer and so on. But what we found was a tremendous uh, outpouring of interest in the, uh, in the community, people willing to uh, help. So we saw a tremendous potential in that and started a design, I think a design that very consistent with our organization, which is an infrastructure organization, how do you get thousands and even millions of people to do things where you have no control over them? So there has to be some kind of a credible foundation and ways of replicating this across the economy via professional societies, uh, trade associations, if possible, state organizations and so on. But we had no idea, no remote concept that this would uh, catch on and turn out to be a way of um, embedding uh, ways of cooperating throughout the economy. So that's a, a brief capsule um, of the uh, early history. We had that responsibility early on to um, designed a framework, and we worked on that, uh, worked on a, a concept that would um, necessarily, in its operation, involve many people who, in turn, could take these ideas back through their companies. So we tried to have broad involvement, and we tried to create a condition where it was a competition to become an examiner not just an automatic um, assignment for anyone who was interested. And so the credibility that the individuals received from that selection had them go back to their companies to build something, and they received 
uh, credit in, 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 as experts. And many of those people, some present in this room, my friend Gary Floss from Minnesota, were taking those ideas to their states. And uh, later on, we worked with the National Governors Association to develop a kind of replication model that would perhaps interest most of the states. So that's how, um, in effect, um, the uh, concepts were woven together to create um, mutually reinforcing networks. But believe me, the leadership, the distributed leadership we see in the form of, um, of, of Marie and Katie here um, are not something that you can get hand delivered from Washington. That energy has to be created here from the start, has to be built from the start, and has to have a credible process that ties back to the national process. So anyway, that's a brief um, sort of philosophical, but also sort of some of the mechanics, how it got the name, and how it has sort of an unusual history being with a technical agency, but our technical agency has responsibilities to have the um, measurements, that, uh, measurements and standards that are developed by our organization be used throughout the economy. So basically, we were trying to replicate as many of those concepts as possible. All right. Well, thank you. And speaking of energy and uh, state-level things, Marie, you were, you were here at the <laughs> beginning, at least the beginning of the TQA, the Tennessee Quality Award. Uh, describe some of the early years from, from your perspective and, and uh, especially from the Baldridge Supply Chain Partnership and maybe the goals of the state of Tennessee, or at least the goals of the designer of the award? Uh, well, first of all, very close partnership, obviously, with the Baldridge National Quality Award. Our responsibility, as we looked at the time, there was uh, just really within the business community, and Eastman was very influential with this at the time, how do we get better? Our focus was taking and building partnerships for continuous improvement. And my role, quite frankly, in, in part of that was to be able to translate it to Southern English. We were the first state to have y'all in the criteria. <laughs> but, but for us, it was we all have things we do well, and we all have areas in which we can improve. And so we took the process of rep rep recognizing, we'll try that again, the steps along the journey so that it wasn't the focus of the prize, but it was the focus of improvement. And with that, when we first, through the partnership with the Ned McWhorter, who supported and brought to the table from the governor's perspective, credibility, if you will. And um, Ned McWhorter would even dial for dollars for us to help establish the program. But when we made the announcement, Bob Bell was on the founding board of directors, Susan Williams is here, I think, uh, Don Fisher, and please forgive me for not mentioning others. Ned McWhorter and I knew there was an office with a borrowed 50-year-old desk, my personal IBM 360 <laughs> computer, and a plethora of volunteers who were working on developing the multi-level criteria, who were developing examiner training, who were looking at having the process to, Im to improve and involve across all sectors. We were in some ways an innovative uh, laboratory for the Baldridge. And they were the parent, if you will. They were the expert. But we got down in the trenches and learned, how do you make it happen here? How do you make it happen in Pulaski or Lewisburg or any of the other marvelous parts of this great state of Tennessee? And that first year, we were totally blown away with 105 applicants, 
a brand new board of examiners. And for those of you that are examiners, how many of you would love to do four applications the first year? <laughs> you, did you write down the names? <laughs> so that what we saw was ownership at this level that we could be and were, became the role model for other state programs and other countries to share the wisdom from Tennessee. And um, it's a journey that is continuing. And one of the real exciting things to me is to see how far it's come beyond my wildest dreams and under the leadership of Katie and the board of directors and others. But I also look around this room and I see people who said, yes, Marie, 20 years ago. And they learned how to continue saying, yes, Katie, give me another application. Yes, Katie, <laughs> I'll do that for you. So thank you for building, from my perspective, a personal dream of a state of excellence in Tennessee. Well, thank you. And the, the journey continues. Harry, we're, um, the, the Baldridge program is in some ways relatively mature now. At least we've had a bunch of cycles of learning as we've, uh, we've gone through the process. We have new fields of awards from what was um, there originally. Can you talk some about those cycles of learning and, and um, maybe about some of the current challenges with the Baldridge journey? Sure. Um, well, maybe to start with, I, I'm not sure I'd call us mature. I think the, <laughs> the day that we become mature as a program is, is probably the, the day we end as a program. If we aren't constantly learning, constantly changing, constantly evolving, uh, we wouldn't be relevant and you wouldn't be interested uh, in, in the Baldridge program. But uh, we've certainly been through many, many cycles of learning. Uh, we've added lots of categories. When the award started, there was manufacturing, service, and small business. There's now education, healthcare, and nonprofit in addition, including uh, government agencies as part of the nonprofit. So virtually now the, the Baldridge program covers the whole economy. I think that's been one of the, the great uh, changes in the Baldridge program, actually anticipated uh, in the law when the uh, Baldridge program was created because it was anticipatory of adding additional categories in the way the language uh, was written. I think probably the single greatest learning uh, from the Baldridge program, and, and uh, Bruce Kintz um, hinted at it or, or even spoke about it in his remarks already, is the ability to learn across sectors. Uh, and while we have separate criteria for education and healthcare, they're really just um, a translation of the same criteria into language that's more friendly uh, in those communities. So it really is one set of criteria, and it's the cross-sector learning that has really been, uh, I think, a major uh, accomplishment of the Baldridge program over the years. And indeed, when we field a team now, as I'm sure is the case in the state programs, for an applicant, we will always have sector expertise on that application, but we'll also have people from other sectors because we want them to learn as examiners and bring it back to their own sectors. And we want them to bring uh, to the applicant they're reviewing the expertise uh, from their sectors. Uh, obviously, the program has also evolved uh, in other ways uh, over time, uh, and the criteria have evolved and, and continue to evolve. Uh, and we've really moved from, as Kurt uh, said, a set of criteria that while uh, aimed at manufacturing service and small business really were born out of a, a crisis in manufacturing in the United States and were really uh, about improving manufacturing performance uh, and product quality in the U.S. to now a set of criteria that are really about organizational excellence and organizational quality overall, having morphed from uh, in the early days, and I remember Kurt and I uh, talking about this when I joined the program, could we dare move from talking about the organization's quality planning to the organization's overall strategic planning 
and would businesses and organizations be willing to share that with us? Of course, we made that move, and, and what we've learned over time is really if you don't take that holistic approach, and if you're using Baldrige, if you don't embed that in the way you operate the organization as a whole, uh, you're probably chasing an award and not getting the benefit uh, that the, the program offers. And uh, you know, just as two examples of that, um, Marie mentioned uh, Eastman Chemical, and I remember Ernie Davenport, the CEO of Eastman Chemical, when they received the Baldrige Award, was asked about uh, winning the award, and his comment at the time was, we didn't use the Baldrige criteria to win an award, we used the Baldrige criteria to win business. And just taking that up to the, the current time period, uh, Ruland Stacy, who's the CEO of Poudre Valley uh, Healthcare in Colorado, which, by the way, has just recently swallowed the largest healthcare system in Colorado in, in a merger, uh, when he was asked, uh, about his use of the Baldrige criteria. He said, his comment was, there are people alive today in our community who would not otherwise be alive had we, alive had we not adopted the Baldrige criteria. So it's really, uh, for those of you who are getting started, about improving your organization. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, obviously, uh, there have been challenges um, in recent years, not just in terms of criteria direction, which continues to evolve, but also in terms of the program itself, with the loss of the federal appropriation for the program a year ago. Uh, I think we're now um, through a very, very tough period, but now sort of out of the, the, the depths of the challenges we faced, and, and you know, we, in Baldrige, we always preached about change. This year we had the opportunity to practice it. Uh, and I always used to say, you know, change is good when it's happening to somebody else or comes from a vending machine. Um, it has now come to the program, but I think we've emerged from it stronger. Uh, we have a very committed Baldrige Foundation that is engaged on fundraising to uh, secure the future. Uh, we have a uh, much more robust uh, fee-based structure, which means that you don't get criteria free anymore, except in Tennessee, uh, but others have to, to purchase the criteria. Uh, and we've also developed a much stronger relationship uh, as a result of this with the Baldridge uh, enterprise broadly, uh, including uh, the Baldridge Foundation, ASQ, and uh, the Alliance of State Programs. So I think we've moved also over the years from sort of a a parent uh, relationship with the state programs to now uh, a pretty tight partnership uh, with the state programs. And I see that as the, uh, the way we will move forward and continue to build nationally, while at the same time, just to, to give you a sense of the dimensions of the Baldridge reach, there are now about 100 programs around the globe that are based on Baldridge. So, uh, our definition of performance excellence has now basically become the de facto definition around the globe. And I think that in the long term will be good for American competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And Katie, uh, Tennessee competitiveness. Uh, the Tennessee program has evolved too over the years. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the alignment between this program and Baldridge and uh, maybe also about uh, some of the essential partnerships here in, the, in this state and the challenges we have to reinvent and to, to innovate. I joined TNCPE about nine years ago and um, it was pretty daunting to be following Marie Williams in that position because she had built such a reputation and so much respect for the Tennessee program, as it turns out, not just in Tennessee, but around the country. Um, and I, Marie talked about the tiers of applications in Tennessee. That was a Tennessee innovation that has been adopted by many other states now to not just have to write a 50-page application, but to actually groom organizations as they go through the process with five pages. 15, 35, and then the big enchilada. Mm -hmm. 
And so my first year with the program, my main goal was not to break anything. Um, and I remember the first awards banquet, at the end of the banquet, I got a standing ovation and I realized then that people were afraid with Marie gone that the program was going to die. <laughs> and they were so relieved that we had made it through a cycle and had done so successfully, which to me really is a comment on the sustainability of the program, that it wasn't just the strength of the, the director, but the strength of the community of people in Tennessee that believed in the Baldrige Criterion, believed in this program as a way of driving organizational improvement in Tennessee. So when, when we started in 1993, I would describe our relationship with the Baldrige program more like, as Harry said, a parent-child relationship, and I think that has evolved over the years. I don't think that we are equals, but I think we are much more uh, in partnership with the national program and building partnerships in the state as well that I think really are the future of us being able to continue to do what we do successfully. Um, last October, we signed a, a letter of agreement with the University of Tennessee for TNCPE and UT to work together to take our services to drive improvement in state and local government. And that's an example of something that I think that we're going to be doing more of in the future. Um, it's a way of leveraging the resources that we have and leveraging the resources of our partners as well. A lot of roads yet on the, on the journey. Uh, we've got a lot to celebrate, a lot of, of past history that, that's been exciting, but um, so what? So what? Where do we go from here? Any of you want to comment on uh, how we transform the future? Harry, you've sort of introduced that already. Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, in terms of enterprise, uh, we transform the, the future uh, by partnerships. Uh, I think the future for Baldridge overall is one that is much more built on relationships and partnerships rather than uh, sort of a, a, a monolith in, in Washington that is reaching out. And, you know, we see that, as I said, not only with the states, but with the other international programs. Uh, for example, at, at the upcoming Quest for Excellence in April, which will be the 25th anniversary of the Baldridge program. Uh, we will have a plenary session not only involving this year's Baldridge Award uh, winner CEOs, but a second one that will involve CEOs from around the globe, from Baldridge-based awards around the globe, sharing uh, their learnings uh, with our group. So I think, you know, we are in a global economy, obviously, and I think we will see a lot more um, cooperation uh, and, and competition, and I think part of the future, uh, and, and I think this will be reflected in the Baldrige criteria exactly how in the future, I don't know, but a lot more of it will be on the dynamic tension uh, between cooperation, collaboration, and um, competition, uh, protection of intellectual property, uh, not just uh, outsourcing, but insourcing again, and how that plays itself out in terms of uh, developing uh, performance-based systems. I think those sorts of things will, will come into the criteria in the future. Uh, I, of course, the other um, great um, um, sort of look into the future, at least from my perspective, is the tremendous uh, impact that Baldridge has had on healthcare and is having on healthcare. Uh, there was just a, a recent study conducted by the American College of Healthcare Executives and a branch of the American Medical Association of hospital uh, leaders around the country, and I believe the number was upwards of 60 percent said that they would be uh, using Baldridge and applying for their state or the national award over the next five years. I don't know how we'll handle that application burden if that comes <laughs> into being, but you know, what does that say about the relevance of this framework to an industry 
that is burdened with the need to reduce cost and at the same time improve quality, and that's really what um, the Baldridge criteria are about. I guess my biggest hope for the future is that we get to the point where that same realization comes to education and we can see the same use in education, same benefits in education that I think we're starting to see in healthcare. Others? Anybody else have a comment on that? Uh, <clears throat> I would just say I uh, agree with, uh, with Harry, particularly on the uh, education side. I, I think I see that as the, as the most difficult category because of the unit of analysis, the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, very often the school systems are a plaything in the political arena. Uh, and so things that are, uh, require stability and, and, and a vision uh, and an and investment in uh, training of teachers, uh, development of students, uh, can't be sort of meddled with by h higher forces uh, constantly churning. So I see that as the most sticky of the categories. But the thing I'd like to, to add to, uh, to Harry's point, um, in the evolution of criteria across, I think, all of the categories, the evolution toward um, greater accommodation and adaptation of uh, innovation processes and, de and deliberate focus on innovation processes to uh, constantly have that uh, dynamic tension between um, change and stability. Um, uh, quality has its roots in stability. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that was the biggest, one of the biggest challenges we faced early on is that so many of the people who wanted to help had a concept not of quality management, but of quality control. And so they expected everything to be documented to a fairly well and, and people being able to prove with stacks of documentation that everything was working. And this was just simply not going to be uh, the, the way of the future. So the, um, that change and I think the bringing in of the other sectors has really helped us get past, to get past that point. But I think the dynamic tension between the innovative, innovative processes and so on. And I recall also um, for, uh, building on what Harry said in the early days um, when we were looking at, uh, at what we were learning from some of the awardees, I remember that the, uh, a big challenge that Eastman faced was the getting the um, research and development people involved in the quality process. Well, Harry and I, both being chemists, knew a lot, of, a lot about that problem. So, uh, but it was interesting that the uh, uh, thing I, I very clearly recall was that how much effort was put to, to build ties between, closer ties between R&D and the customer base. In other words, the customer focus was an increase. Now, I'm sure there are others here who know a whole lot more about that, but the point is that it wasn't just, hey, uh, you should have processes and, and uh, approaches very similar to ours. It was uh, adapting it to the real requirements and the real personalities and character of these different parts of the organization. And that, I think, is also true as, as the program faces these sector differences. There's so much learning from those sector differences because most organizations have some other sector-like groups within them. So I always felt that the most exciting future for the program would be the mixing of the sectors. And even in the first year, we had people from healthcare and education and so on who weren't eligible, but we wanted to stir that pot as fast as we could. So that uh, gives you some perspective to how organizations of our type tend to think about um, economies and how to, how to try to uh, temper what goes on in economies via structures like uh, standards, uh, performance standards, and so forth. But everything depends upon having people, like we've heard from Tennessee, who actually do those things here. So, 
the, the de interdependence is now so much more critical and I think um, conceptually and from the point of view of economic change, uh, the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, gains should lie in the future. What about the future of Tennessee? Katie, Marie? Or have they one said it the, all? <laughs> one of the big opportunities, I think, for us, um, probably as a nation, is what we're headed to, and really it comes right out of the criteria, systems approach to, uh, to driving improvement in your organization. We're moving toward a more systems approach to managing the Baldridge family or the Baldridge enterprise where there is more integration between the national program and the state programs. Um, now you may be aware in order to be eligible to apply for a Baldridge award you have to have won the top award in your state. And there's a move to bring some consistency to how programs work from state to state. So prior to today there's been um, tremendous variety in how programs are operated, innovative ideas coming out of states, which is a good part of that, but then a lot of discrepancy in what it takes to win the top award. Um, Tennessee is probably leading the way. We're, I would say we're one of the stronger state programs. Um, a lot again due to Marie and how she, how she got this program launched. But um, there are other programs that are looking to us to, mm -hmm. to see how we do things. The state programs then are working together to create consistent standards so that when an organization like Bristol Tennessee Essential Services mm -hmm. wins the Excellence Award in Tennessee or Metropolitan Nashville Airport Authority wins the top award in Tennessee, to ensure that organizations winning the top award in Missouri and Minnesota and Arkansas have met the same stringent standards that we have here so that there's somewhat of a level playing field when they go on to, to win the Baldridge Award and to set up a more systematic way of sharing those best practices then between states as well as at the national level. So I think that's a tremendous opportunity for us going forward. And I would, have to, I would add to that by saying that what we have is the 20 years of continuous improvement of the process itself within the state because we took the, the approach from the get-go of we all, there was no, there was not any organization not eligible in Tennessee. We went to the not-for-profit sector, we went to education, we went to healthcare, manufacturing, and so that with that, both building the cross-sector learnings and the complexion, if you will, of the examining team, that became the entity within itself that helped drive that. My husband has a term for me that, if you'll pardon me, but it's very descriptive. He thought my role in this organization was to fertilize. And with that, what happened is, is that it grows through the efforts of you and sharing and excitement and knowledge and that type of thing. And as we've seen that learning, I think particularly with the increased uh, equality of the partnership in many ways with Baldridge, our lessons learned go up as well as down, but now we're looking at them across the sector of integration. And I applaud that so that in 1993, we started that anyone can do it, anyone can, any organization can get better, and then move the model to other states and to other countries. There are a couple of people in this room that made uh, trips through the program as visiting scholars in the country of Mauritius to help establish a quality award there with the president of the country. So that what happened is that each time we shared, we learned how do you drive that in different cultures, in different languages, in different sectors, and to move that process forward. And what we see now is greater sharing, greater knowledge, 
um, and a tremendous improvement in the excellence of the Tennessee Center for Performance Excellence. Thank you. Well, let's move to voice of the customer. What kind of questions do, uh, do you have for this distinguished panel? Somebody's got to have a question. Yes. That's a great question. The question was, given the focus in the current economy on economic development and jobs, what can we say about how Baldrige and TNCPE has influenced and driven that? Harry, you want to start with yeah. uh, you? Um, well, I'll give you some data that I intended on sharing tonight, but I'll share it now since you asked the question. Uh, but uh, we've actually recently done our second study of two-time Baldridge Award recipients, of which there are six over the history of the program. Uh, they're all from business, uh, but they span the history of the program from the earliest uh, having received the award twice in the 1990s to the most recent having received the award for the second time in, in 2011. Span industries, span uh, size of companies, small business to very large, and we looked at job growth uh, from the first time to the second time they received the Baldridge Award, believing that uh, being two-time recipients, they were practicing use of the Baldridge criteria throughout that period. And the median job growth for our two-time Baldridge Award recipients between the first and second time they received the award was 65.5%. We were able also, through data from the Bureau of Labor, Stati uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, among others, but they were the main source, to get comparison data for their industries for the same time periods as the period for each of them between their first and second receipt of the Baldridge Award. Mm -hmm. And the mean job growth for their matched industries and matched time periods was 2.5%. So that's a 30-fold difference between Baldridge Award recipients and the economy as a whole. So is, is Baldridge or use of the Baldridge criteria good for job growth? You know, this isn't an exhaustive data set, but certainly it's pretty powerful. And at the suggestion of the national program, we did the same study in Tennessee. Um, at that time, we had had two two-time excellence award winners. Pal, Sudden Service, and Mountain States Health Alliance. And so we gathered jobs data for those two organizations, and the Baldridge Office helped us with the comparison data. Um, and we found the same result that they had found with the national winners, that the job creation had been much higher in those two organizations than their counterparts within the same industry during the same five-year, or with us, yeah, the same five-year period. And now, if we were to do the study again, we could add one more organization to the list, because Bristol, Tennessee Essential Services is about to uh, receive their second Tennessee Excellence Award tonight. So we've got a third two-time winner. Kirk? Uh, yeah, let me uh, give a slightly different uh, line of, of observation to the same uh, question. Um, after retiring uh, as a Baldrige director, I had the good fortune to uh, join Tennessee Tech part-time and w work for uh, Dr. Bell. And uh, through that work uh, and his work and the work of others, uh, there's been a great deal of emphasis on economic development and uses of, of Baldrige-like criteria to try to upgrade communities in their efforts to um, uh, uh, launch economic development um, was mentioned earlier about the connection with the U University of Tennessee. University of Tennessee is part of a national network of manufacturing assistance centers using um, criteria and factors very similar to and derived from Baldridge, but also um, with, with, with state and local uh, intervention, many of which involve Baldridge examiners, former Baldridge examiners and so on, at the state level. So there's a great deal happening in economic development, which is 
trying to wire together some of the things we've been talking about today. And that's why it's so critical to get additional sectors into joining these types of efforts. For example, as uh, state economic development people learn these tools and as, um, as state city, uh, city managers, state managers and so on learn these tools and techniques, they can begin to use these same concepts in their economic development thinking. So um, I'm seeing this happen, and I'm seeing it happen really quite well in many ways in Tennessee, certainly from the perspective from the Upper Cumberland with Bob and his people there. I certainly saw that sensitivity, and perhaps uh, um, I, Marie and um, Katie can talk about some of the uh, ties that they've had with these community um, evaluations, what is it, three-star um, mm -hmm. evaluations and so on. So I'd say that um, uh, Harry gave one very, very direct and important answer, Baldridge defined in terms of Baldridge participants, but if you define it as the 99.99% .99 of people out there who are not narrowly award participants, but who have real lives, real jobs, and so on, taking them in other directions, that's where I think um, so much more can and should be done. But I think a great deal more is happening there than perhaps any of us really appreciate. Great, great. Uh, an another question from anyone? In the back, Don. My question is to uh, uh, Dr. Ryman and Dr. Hertz. Is, uh, Dr. Ryman is the father of the Baldwin Award, and I think we all know that. And he's got a lot to offer, and Harry's kind of like the first son. So when are you going to write a book uh, as uh, a foundation for all of us to learn from and grow? Because you all have just such a wonderful experience, and your concept is what we all follow, your ideas. And so, uh, so we're interested, when, when is that book going to come out? And I'll bet Bruce Kent will publish it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to add information to the last question. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I don't know, we haven't talked, obviously, at, at all about a book. But just one further thought on economic development. Uh, as I look toward the future, and one of the most exciting potentials, I believe, for the Baldrige criteria, and one that I can't say is really getting traction yet, but we're starting to have discussions about and, and getting some interest in, is use of the Baldrige criteria in building healthy communities. And what I mean by that is communities that are willing to bring together uh, government, education, business, economic development, and look at uh, use of the Baldrige criteria to explore um, improvement of the community and the health of the community as a whole. So using the organizational profile and writing it for the community at the, as a whole, identifying the strategic challenges, for example, for the community to be a healthy community in every sense, not just the health of its citizens, but the economic health of the community. And, and that, to me, is one of the most exciting potential next generation uses of the Baldrige criteria. And we're starting to see some dialogue around that in a number of communities now. And do you want to talk about three star or community development or other things? If, if I might interject, uh, I would encourage all of you to listen to the presentation with Bristol, Tennessee, essential services <laughs> tomorrow or today, actually, because that is this whole concept was developed from an economic development perspective to help improve. And within uh, BTES, they are involved intimately in the entire community so that their model both serves within that region, but their very business and existence is dependent upon the successful um, well-being of the community in which they live, work, and do business. And it's, we talked a little about job growth, and I think we need to stretch that too to recognize as we do in the real business community, it may not just be adding the faces, 
but rather it might be increasing the efficiency and effectiveness to provide many more services at a much higher level with the same core number of employees. So it's either money saved or money earned that help develop that well-being in your community. Yeah, well said, well said. Let's see, we've got time for one more question. There was a question over here. Um, the uh, current cycle for revision of the criteria is biennial, so every other year in the odd numbered years, so 2013 is a criteria uh, change year. I'd say that uh, right from the very start, uh, the, the changes in the criteria year on year have been evolutionary. Uh, but if you take, let's say, any 10 year period in the history of the Baldrige program now, and look at the criteria, you'd see that they're quite different uh, over a 10-year period from what they were uh, 10 years uh, before. The aim is that the criteria always be at the leading edge of validated management practice, which was a uh, expression coined by Arnie Weimerskirsch, a chair of the panel of judges uh, back in the early 90s, I guess. Uh, we go through a, a pretty rigorous process uh, every two years in revision of the criteria, starting with uh, just reading, listening, seeing what leading organizations have put into practice and succeeded with. Uh, we then uh, gather information uh, through uh, a broad call for anybody to contribute their thought, thoughts on either revisions or uh, uh, discontinuous changes to the criteria to reflect that leading edge of validated management practice. Uh, we have uh, a virtual improvement discussion uh, on the web and we take all that information and from that uh, draft a first draft of the new criteria. That first draft goes out to anybody who's made significant comment that led to change as well as to our panel of judges and our board of overseers, our two advisory uh, bodies. They then comment on that draft and from that uh, the next version of the criteria um, are generated. So it's, a, it's almost a two year long process uh, with gathering lots of input. So it, it's, it's basically the closest we can come uh, to a consensus of what the challenges are and what represents leading edge management practice, validated management practice. Harry, thank you, thank you. These folks are going to be around uh, for the rest of the program. I hope you get a chance to talk to them individually and uh, uh, shamelessly steal an idea or two. Uh, panelists, it's been an honor to have all of you at this TNCPE program. Uh, we look forward to a great program in the rest of the day. Thank each of you for being here, and I hope you have a great session. Thank you very much.